good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you are. We're back on with our Careers in the Cloud podcast, and we're still on the Velocity SFI Salesforce Industries Salesforce in general special episode again. Legend uh, building, Nick. I know. I know. I say legend a lot. It's a, it's a term that's thrown thrown around loosely, but really though, this guy is a legend. I mean. He didn't know it, but we've come across him so many times in the ecosystem. I think he interviewed many of our candidates at SFI, so it's thanks to him a lot of these people got the opportunity, and he's had an extensive career. He's moved around all around in the world. I know you've wanted him on this podcast for a while, Nick, so it's only right you introduce him. Who have we got on the show today, Nick? What SFI legend did you bring on? And one and only, Georgi Saviliev. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Welcome again. Thank you so, so much for doing this with us. We're, again, we're super bummed. I know I say it all the time, but I genuinely mean it every single time. So thank you so much for, for being here with us. Um, how yeah. are you feeling? Thanks a lot, guys. I, I feel like, you know, after that intro, you know, you, you set the bar pretty high. But yeah, I'm really excited <laughs> to be here, um, especially after watching Richard's episode last time. If you didn't catch that episode, definitely watch it. Very inspiring. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I had some conversations with Montreal Associates earlier, and you know I've watched a few episodes of your podcast, so uh, I was very humbled when you asked me to be on, and yeah, excited to be here. Um, but yeah, I'm great. So I'm in uh, sunny Dubai. It is like 32 degrees here, and compared to you guys in Europe, you know, I don't know, it's what 10 or 15 or something. So like a completely different. See the world change in, in dress code, and, and and Georgie just rubbing it in that little bit. But I mean, we'll get <laughs> onto that because look, you you've lived. In, in different places. I think you're someone when we t talk about relocation, setting up a new life, we'll definitely get into that, Georgie, because you're someone that's done it and you've just done it recently, which will be interesting to hear because with the UAE, as many people know, the ecosystem is, is very up and coming. There seems to be a lot more investment. I saw today on your LinkedIn, there'll be the first user group, uh, which seems super exciting. But for those that don't know you, right, because look, we're, we're fanboys and girls in, in many ways, generally, like you're a name that has resonated with us for years and now we get to finally speak to you. But for those that don't know what SFI is or even Salesforce or what a CTA even means in the ecosystem, how did you get into SFI and, and give us a little intro into you uh, as much as you want to share? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so maybe let's start from the beginning. So my name is Georgi Sibeliev and Nicoletta, good job. You were like very, very close. Um, yeah, so where do I start? Okay, so you might notice that I have a very not American name, but a very American accent. I'm originally from Russia, grew up in the US and then lived all over. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, but in terms of Salesforce, so the way I got started is, well, maybe taking a step back. Um, I went to university in the US uh, at the University of Wisconsin. I graduated from there and joined a local company, um, uh, General Electric Healthcare. So you might know General Electric as, you know, a manufacturer of like light bulbs, refrigerators, et cetera. But it's actually a huge conglomerate that builds uh, airplane engines, healthcare equipment like CT, MRIs, ultrasounds, et cetera. They have a bunch of different um, business units. So I started at the um, healthcare business unit. And I joined a leadership program there. So it's like a two year rotational program uh, where you do a variety of different roles. So I had a few roles um, as like a BA, a PM, uh, a technical BA. And one of those roles was on the Salesforce team with uh, GE. Um, and, you know, I first touched Salesforce back in 20, 2013. And I feel like, I don't know, after maybe the first day or something on being uh, of being on the Salesforce team, I was just like, wow, I really love this technology. This is just really cool. You know, being in a big company like that, there's uh, oftentimes a lot of uh, governance and overhead of getting access to systems. It takes like weeks to even be able to get into a development environment and play around with it. Um, but what I was really impressed about with Salesforce is they were just able to like spin up the sandbox. I was able to log in and just start building something pretty much immediately. So I was just like very impressed with how how easy it was. And I could see, you know, this is really a platform that can deliver some business value and would be interesting for me. So uh, I, I finished that program after two years and then joined the Salesforce team full time. Uh, and at that point, we were doing a digital transformation program on uh, Aptis. It's a CPQ tool, which is now known as Conga CPQ. And you know, keep this in mind because that will play into the SFI um, area in a bit. 
Uh, I did Aptus for like two years, and you know our specific in implementation was being able to sell all this healthcare equipment through Salesforce, being able to configure it, do the pricing, do the approvals, etc. And actually, just recently, I went to the uh, I went to the clinic, got an ultrasound for myself. Everything is fine, but you know, just being cautious. And I saw that that ultrasound machine, and it was a GE machine, and I was like. You know, actually, I, I implemented this, or I was on the team that implemented this in Aptus, and you know, potentially it was being sold through a project I did. And That's got to make you feel good, Rich. Uh, as well, like what, when you when you go and see that, it kind of brings everything to full circle, right? And things happen yeah. for a reason, and you're part of that, which we'll yeah. get into more. But obviously, for some people that again don't know as well, what you did when you joined Salesforce to where you started, which we'll go into. Was a was a hell of a career so far. Like obviously you can touch on it more and more, and I'm sure Nikki's got some questions on it. But from where you started in your journey, just as you discussed it then, to where you ended up just now, dude, you covered a lot of ground. And I don't just mean yeah. mileage. <laughs> yeah, no, I, You've done I that mean, too. it's just it's just really cool um, to see the the impact of what you're doing. You know, it's easy to get lost in the day to day of meetings, emails, etc. But then when you see it in real life, it's just like wow, you know. What I'm doing actually makes an impact, and that's super cool. I, I feel like that was one of the things that really pulled me into the, the platform. Um, but so uh, after GE, I joined a small SI. I relocated back to Moscow. I was there for like about a year and a half. Um, I, I met my uh, girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, we got married there, and she got a job in Amsterdam. And then I was like, okay, well, now I need to find something to do. I don't know anyone in Amsterdam. Uh, I have no idea what the job prospects are. You know, what should I do? So um, I was looking through LinkedIn, through the job postings, and I saw a posting for Velocity for a technical architect. And I was like, I have no idea what Velocity is. But then I saw that <laughs> <laughs> I thought that I, uh, I have a mutual connection or, or like one of my connections works at Velocity, and I was like, oh, okay, this is one of the people that I worked for, uh, worked with on the Salesforce program at GE. Let me reach out to this guy. Um, so we had a nice conversation. I was actually at Brazil on vacation at the time. Uh, so I was like calling him with really shoddy internet, but you know, the connection was good enough to at least understand what was going what's on. The, what's this Velocity that I see? <laughs> <coming in right now? laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, Basically, you know, he explained what it is, uh, explained that, you know, part of it is a CPQ tool, but really it's it's much bigger than that. And I was like, okay, well, um, I don't know these other things. I don't know the telco industry. I don't know these other industries that Velocity does, but I at least have subject matter expertise on CPQ. I know the Salesforce platform, you know, let's try this. I think um, it will take some time for me to get up to speed, but I can at least hit the ground running. And that brought me to uh, Velocity in Amsterdam. That's absolutely Sorry. amazing, an amazing way to get in. Actually, I, you know, we always think about like people getting into velocity, just uh, learning on trail by trailhead, trail bears or whatever it is that they're doing. But there is actually another way around. That's um, inspiring. But it goes really back amazing. to the whole network, right? And, and, exactly. and I think what we always advise people, Nick, on, you know, reaching out to people yeah. and just asking those questions or connecting with people mm -hmm. and, and the Aptus experience in its own way was a great crossover because that CPQ experience that you built up, Yogi, like it all played its part in for you getting that role of SFI, right? And, and becoming an SFI specialist that you are today, which we'll talk about more. Yeah. 100%. Um, and and uh, sorry, just to continue on that. And frankly, like when I when I looked at that job posting for the Velocity position, um, I was kind of interested, but there were a bunch of other positions that seemed more interesting. So I frankly, I think I would have just overlooked it if I didn't have a connection there. So. You know, you, you never know who you meet that ends up completely changing the course of your future. So yeah, so true. yeah, always, always think about those connections. The power of network these days yeah. is absolutely um, insane, but in a good way, hundred um, percent. All right, so talk us a little bit through how you became a CTA and um, how did it actually affect your your career? I, I think it was like a huge step for you and. What are some benefits that you see that I'm sure there's many of them? Are there some negatives that you probably see in it? I'm not sure if there can be any, but talk us through it. Yeah, so in terms of CTA, um, I started getting into the architect certificates back in like, I think, um, 2017. So I did application architect uh, before I joined Velocity. And then in Velocity, I started doing uh, system architect and a few other certificates. And um, I don't really remember what the exact moment was that I decided I wanted to do CTA, but 
uh, back in GE, we had uh, one uh, one pretty well known CTA uh, that was based in the US and he was on our project. So I like was aware of what CTA was and I, I knew this guy. I thought, wow, this is you know a real professional. I feel like that that could be something that would be interesting to do someday. But it was always like a wild pipe dream. And I feel like just after being uh, after being an architect in Velocity for a while, I started really flexing those architect muscles in a good way and <laughs> just decided at some point, OK, like I need to do this. But um, I was being really foolish and I was like, OK, CTA is going to be something that I'll spend maybe like, I don't know, two or three months preparing for, just knock it out. You know, that's it. It's just another certificate. But that's completely not the case. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like you can you can knock out one of these uh, smaller certificates and maybe like a week with dedicated practice, maybe a month. But CTA is, is a completely different beast. It's going to consume like one or two years of your life. Um, so that that's how it was for me. So um, I think I started preparing um, like the, the seed got planted probably in the second half of 2018. I feel like uh, in 2019 there was a bit of a break and then I really started preparation in like um, 20. 2021, I would say. So um, between like roughly January, February 2021 until um, I, I had my first review board in uh, July of that year. And then um, I, I failed that one. I went for the second review board in October of that year. So like end to end, the really concentrated preparation was something like nine months. But also, I was doing a bunch how of hard, how hard is the board review? Like I've always heard feedback, and I wanted your honest opinion because look, we speak to a lot of aspiring CTAs, and only a few make it, as you know, right? Like, but from mm -hmm. your honest opinion, how difficult is it, and and what was your viewpoint when you failed the first time? Like to have the resilience to go back again and do it again. But how was it the first time for you? That whole experience and like coming out of it, you know. But where was your head at? Because it must have been it must have been difficult. But also when you got rejected to do it again, it must have been even harder. But you know, what advice would you give to someone that's looking to do it? Yeah, I mean, frankly, it's very difficult. Um, you're sitting in front of three other three CTAs. You know, they're grilling you on your solution. They're um, asking you the end level of detail about something about your solution, trying to find gaps. You know. Uh, seeing if you really understand what you're talking about, if your solution really works end to end, if you have any gaps, it's it's tough. I'm not gonna lie. I feel like if I were to take it again, like this week, I would fail for sure. Just no question, 100%. I would fail. I mean, it's very difficult. You have to prepare a lot. You have to do a lot of mocks. Uh, even if you have the, you know, technical presentation communication skills to do it, it still takes a lot of preparation to to solve for the time management piece. Because uh, it's not a multiple choice exam. You get like a pretty lengthy scenario. You have three hours to solve it. Then you present your solution to the judges for 45 minutes, and then you have 40 minutes Q and A. There's a, a bit of additional time if you're not, not a native English speaker, but I mean, you know, end to end, it's like a five or six hour thing. And given the amount of material, it, it's quite, you know, quite lengthy. You don't really have the um, yeah, you, you don't have the time to just sit and think. You really need to just be constantly solving and like working at 100% capacity for three Sounds hours. It's tough. In, in hindsight, it, was it worth it? And I don't know that's a, a, a weird question to ask because it's such a high accolade, but I've spoken to other CTAs and they're like, well, in hindsight, I don't know how it would have affected my career if I didn't do it and I kind of didn't do this with it. But for you, did it really play all that work, all that sacrifice, all that dedication and everything that you had to do to get there? Did you genuinely see the benefits of it later on in your career and even now? Yeah, I mean, I, I got CTA like roughly a year ago, so I, I feel like I'm just starting to begin to realize the benefits of it now. Um, but to your point, I mean, it, it is a huge sacrifice. I probably spent, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 hours of my personal time preparing on nights and weekends. I basically just did not have a life for one year. Um, you know, luckily one one positive of COVID is I probably wouldn't have been spending the time productively or in a good way anyway. So it was a good use of, of time in that sense. But um, yeah, like if, if I had to go through it again now, I just I don't think I could do it. It, it really takes a lot of, out of you mentally. Um, you know, the impact on your friends and family is huge as well. Like, uh, you know, spending time with your wife, your kids, if you have them, uh, your friends, you don't really have the luxury of doing that. 
uh, or you need to, you know, reduce the time you're spending significantly so that you can get that study time and practice time in. So it, it's a huge commitment. But on the other hand, you you gain just a huge amount of skills. Uh, a lot of people think it's purely a technical thing, but I would say a lot of it is a time management thing. A lot of it is a communications thing. You need to be able to, you know, communicate concisely to a C-level audience, be able to explain complex concepts in, in like an easy to understand way. You need to be able to manage your time to actually finish this kind of long scenario in three hours. And these are very important skills that you use day to day. I mean, you'll, you'll get arbitrary deadlines that you need to solve something ASAP, and it's good to kind of build that skill set of being under huge time pressure, doing something very complex and being able to deliver and then present it and, you know, keep your cool, not be freaking out, not be super stressed. Uh, <laughs> these are really, really cool skills to build. And I was thinking, you know, after the first time I failed, I was like, you know, this really sucks. I spent so much time and effort on this. But on the other hand, you know, I built such a huge network. I built all of these great skills. So it, it, it wasn't time not well spent. It was time very well spent. It's just, you know, hard to not get the outcome that you were hoping for. But then, uh, you know, after spending that much effort on it, I feel like, you know, you have that sunk cost fallacy that it's like there's nowhere to go except just keep trying. And so that's what that's what I did. I spent maybe like two or three weeks taking a pause and I was like, OK, let, let's get back on this. Let's do those like daily study sessions, weekly mocks, et cetera, and just go for round two and manage to clear it in round two. So and only one of few in the world, Yogi, as well in SFI that have that yeah. as well. So you can imagine with the way that SFI is going, like the week the three of us know and many may be watching have seen the rise of FSI and what it's going to do even next year and the year after. It's something that's very unique and amazing to have. And, and we can touch on that. The one thing that I wanted to ask you, right? I've relocated. Nikki's done it. Post COVID now, we're seeing relocation in the ecosystem more. But there's still people out there that when we speak to them, there's a hesitancy, right? Especially if they've got families, they've got kids or commitments and networks. They don't see the value of what it can do for their career because there is risk involved, like anything in life. You've lived in Amsterdam, Singapore, you know, America, Russia. What has relocation done for you, not just from a career perspective, but also as a person? And what were the, some of the hardest points of relocation for you? Was there any moments in there where it was a dark time or like where you just really missed home and you felt, I just want to go home? <laughs> I've had enough yeah. of, the, of everything I've seen here. I just want to go home because it's easy to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, frankly, uh, relocating is a very hard thing. Um, I, I don't think everyone can do it, but I feel like if you have the seed planted in your mind that like, hey, I want to live abroad someday or I want to live in this specific country, just do it. You, you know, th think about it from the other perspective. What if you have this dream and you just decide, I'm too afraid to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then, you know, 20 years from now, you're just like, geez, 20 years ago, I could have lived in country X. Why didn't I do that? You know, um, I, I feel like that was kind of a driver for me. I always wanted to live abroad. And um, luckily, with my experience with GE, I had a lot of experience of traveling internationally for different workshops and stuff because we were we had a global implementation. So I was able to kind of dip my toe in living abroad of, you know, living out of a suitcase, traveling all the time. Um, but not go that full step of actually relocating. And then eventually I was like, OK, you know, I want to do this. It doesn't seem that scary. I can do this. And I just did it. And to your earlier question about what does it do for you personally, I feel like it, it just um, opens your eyes in a way that just traveling itself as a tourist can't do. I feel like, you know, now when I go back to the US, I look at it from a completely different perspective, things that I just didn't think about at all. I go back to the US and I'm just like, wow, why is it like that? You know, I've lived in other places, they do it differently. It's really cool to get that kind of different perspective that you just cannot get unless you've like lived somewhere um, somewhere else for an extended period of time. But then at the same time, it, al it also makes you appreciate some things back at home that maybe you didn't like as much as well. Like for me, one of the best things about going back to the US is you have cheap electronics, you go to a Walmart, there's just everything, the store is absolutely huge. And then you go to a similar place in Europe, the store is very small, high taxes, less selection, you know. So everything has its pros and cons, and it's just kind of cool to be able to experience that firsthand. It, it just really cool opens your mind. Yogi as well. I mean, it's not like, you know, anyone should feel sick. You picked some good places. That's what I was going to ask you as well, did it? I know Amsterdam, you mentioned, happened when you got married and then your wife got a job there. But how did Singapore come about? 
So uh, Singapore is kind of an interesting story. So when I was at GE, my um, one of my managers relocated from the US to Singapore and I went there for a business trip for one week. And I just remember going there and I was just like, wow, this is a really cool place. I would love to just <laughs> live here. So <laughs> and then when the, when the opportunity came up, I just seized it right away. So yeah, um, I wouldn't say it was really planned, but uh, I felt like as soon as I saw some opportunity to make it happen, I, I made it happen. Oh man, and now in Dubai, which we'll touch on towards the end, because I think people are going to be watching this going Amsterdam, America, Russia, Singapore, and now Dubai. This guy's like picked some of the best locations. And also maybe you're onto something with what we're seeing in the UAE and, and everything that's going on in terms of Salesforce. It seems like a really hot hub. The one thing that a lot of people ask me when I tell them that I'm doing podcasts with people like you who in their eyes have achieved so much and there's so many highlights and positives. What has been the hardest moment? And, and maybe you answered it for us when you came to the CTA examination. But apart from that, was there ever a moment in your SF career so far that has really been a test where you thought is, you know, am I going to get to that next stage? Even if it was just relocation or you know, moving again to Dubai like you've done recently, which is an unknown territory for you. But if you could share that without being too invasive or be too personal, whatever you want to share, I think it would help a lot to the audience. Yeah, so um, I would say probably the, the hardest thing I encountered was when I moved to Singapore, um, I was working on a project that was just very demanding. The uh, Towards the like second half of the project, it just got very crazy where we were working like 16 hours a day during the week and most of the day, you know, Saturday and Sunday. And I had just moved to Singapore. It was the middle of COVID. Um, I, I knew a couple of people there, so I was able to start making some connections, but I just seriously did not have the time to like go out for even an hour or two for dinner. So I just felt, uh, you know, very socially isolated. Um, it's, it's not easy to move to a new place where you almost don't know anyone. You're all working from home and then you don't even have time to really experience the place um so that was tough I'm not gonna lie <laughs> that, that, um, must so I, a lot, that must have played a lot mentally because you you like i think a lot of us fall into that trap where we dedicate so much to work but the thing out of that did you learn about balance and, and having that social balance because you know no one's going to knock your door because no one knows you so you have to make that effort to actually go out and, and conversate and socialize and meet people right and again, going back to relationships and networks, I bet you eventually, hopefully built some amazing networks in Singapore that are people that you're going to keep in touch with for a while. But it's, I'm glad you touched on that, George, because a lot of people share it. I think with mental health and everything that we're seeing now becoming more and more prominent, they say statistically that people stay indoors more now, especially the newer generation. The socializing aspect and making an effort to go out is becoming less common. So thank you for, mm -hmm. for talking about that and, and actually raising that as well. Yeah, and I would I would say on the on the positives. I mean, it was a tough experience, but it was a good experience to have. You know, now now I know kind of red flags to look out for in a project. I can better try and better sense like, is there a risk that this will become something absolutely crazy, or will this be something more reasonable? Um, and also kind of related to what I said with traveling and like appreciating home more. In the same sense, it was like even being able to sit in front of TV in front of the TV just fetching out watching Netflix for a few hours makes you appreciate that because it's like, you know, thinking back to that time period, I wouldn't have had the luxury of doing that. But now I can at least, you know, I, I can spend the whole evening just watching Netflix during that thing. It really makes you appreciate the small things in life. So I feel like you, you just need to look at everything like on the positive side. There, there are positives in, in all of these experiences. So that's uh, that's that's so true, actually, especially if you think about even current situation, right? So uh... Yeah, let's have more people um, go out of this uh, podcast trying to view the life out of the positive things. Yeah, and uh, w one thing I wanted to comment on the traveling thing, and uh, I mean, I think you were kind of alluding to this. Um, you know, my my journey through my career and through the different places I've lived was completely not planned. You know, it wasn't like uh, 10 years ago, it wasn't like, okay, 10 years from now, I'm going to live here and then here and then here. It just completely happened by chance. And I feel like um, it, it's hard to plan, you know, a long distance into the future. Just try and try and think about, you know, what can I do in the next year or two years? Uh, make a plan for yourself and be ready for things to change and accept that change and just make the best of it. So. It's crazy you say that because I think a lot of people watching this when they think of the locations that you've selected, 
would think that there was thought behind it, which I'm sure when you got to that place, you were like, actually, is, is there a chance that I can build a career here? But to have it where it was spontaneous and, and you went with it, but you didn't plan too far ahead, because we speak to a lot of candidates, Georgie, where they're planning their, their roadmaps mm -hmm. like five, six years down the line. And you don't know with SF, with the market being so vast and technology moving so quick, where you could be. It's like when you were working with Aptus, right? Literally, the way that you got Velocity was opportunistic. You made a call, but what what if you never made that call to your friend or the person that you worked with? You mm -hmm. would have gone down a totally different path and maybe you wouldn't have ended up in Singapore and now Dubai. Uh, but that's something that to take away. I think over planning can some part, sometimes be detrimental to actually reaching your goal and it never lives up to expectation as well. So learn and I, I, I think it's... It. if you've got a supportive wife and she wants to visit different destinations or husband or whatever it is or partner, or even if you're on your own, try it. You never know, right? Home's always there. I mean, if, if it doesn't work out, worst scenario, if you need to, you can always go back to your home comforts and go back to what you used to. But leading on to that, Nick, there was some special news that when we spoke to uh, Yogi last time that he revealed, which I think is going to it's going to cause some ruckus in that UAE market. It's definitely some excitement. I think mm -hmm. it's needed when I speak to a lot of partners out there and, and candidates in the UAE. I think they're screaming out for someone like you, man. So, Nick, if you want to reveal the big reveal. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure how public this is, right? But you've recently opened your own company and you've got now freelancing. Um, obviously, this will be, again, different case for a different country, uh, again, different, probably personalized cases for everyone. But how has it been so far from you? What are some pros? What are some cons you can share with people who are just maybe looking into going freelancing? I know it's like an ongoing topic. So share us your experience so far. Yeah, so I mean, so far it's absolutely amazing. I can't complain at all. And I'm super glad I did this and kind of Similar to what I was saying about travel, you know, if you're thinking about relocating somewhere, just do it. You'll regret it. I, I imagine more, more, more likely than not, you will regret it if you don't do it. I feel like same thing with going independent or opening your company or whatever. If you have that seed in your mind, just do it. You know, you can always go back to working for a big company or SI or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to go for it. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe let me take a step back and talk about how I ended up in Dubai first. Um, so uh, similar to our, our Amsterdam story, my wife got an amazing job offer here <laughs> at a major tech company. And maybe if you look at my background, you can figure out what that is. Uh, so uh, we relocated here and Salesforce didn't or doesn't have, uh, have an office here. So um, yeah, you know, there isn't an option to work remotely for an extended period of time. So that meant that, you know, I need to figure out my own thing. And uh, I, I had this entrepreneurial idea in my mind for quite a while, and I decided to kind of the stars have aligned to make this happen. I did some research on Dubai and UAE, like how to open a company. Um, it's actually very easy. The taxes here are very uh, advantageous for most people. Um, Non-existent. Uh, what <laughs> yeah. I found though with the UAE, Yogi, is opening a bank account is more difficult than opening a business. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I would say in general, it's like very easy. You know, the tax situation is great. It's relatively close to Europe. Time zone wise, it's almost the same time zone as Europe. I mean, I feel like it's just a great place to be. And what I really like is the vibe here. You know, everyone that you're talking to, like majority of people, I think 90% of the population is uh, non-local like expats. Yeah. So almost everyone that you're interacting with is like, hey, you know, I moved here from country X, I'm trying to do Y, I'm opening my company Z, whatever. You know, everyone is hustling, everyone is trying to make something of themselves, everyone has ambition. And it's just really cool to be, you know, in that kind of environment. And I feel like it brings brings out the best in, in yourself, brings out that ambition, makes you work harder. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really cool. There's more of a, there's more of the work-life balance as well, Yogi. I think the buy, if you've not gone, or the people that have gone, there's different, perceptions but i think yogi's right like if you go to dubai for the right reasons you can really accelerate your career build a lot of strong contacts with some influential people that are out there because a lot of companies are going there and also people are in a similar boat right so like you said about relocation networking meeting friends people are in that same boat where they've left their their countries and their lives and their networks and they want to make it and they want to work with like-minded people the one thing i was going to ask you as well leaving salesforce is is a huge decision right like 
it, it's massive. I think speaking to people, you know, we work with Salesforce, and I think when you work for the mothership and the vendor, even though they didn't have an office, it still must have been a tough decision to be in that predicament where you're like, you invested so much with Salesforce, your reputation was so huge, not just in the MIA, but globally. You know, we spoke to people and they were like, have you heard of Yogi? We're like, yes, of course. He interviews all our guys. Uh, <laughs> When did you start getting those thoughts, though, like that you, you talked about entrepreneurship and it's something that with candidates, again, you know, we work with a lot of perm candidates, Yogi, and they they have that that gut feeling where they want to be freelance. They want to do something for themselves. They want to work for themselves. They want to be independent, but something stops them. Like there, there seems to be this mindset and mentality where they just they just can't adjust and, and they know that, you know, they can do it and they'll make not just a lot of money, but they'll be very successful and live a better life, but something holds them back. What's the biggest advice you would give anyone watching right now who's been perm, who thinks they've got everything they want from benefits, salary, you know, they're content. What's the difference to doing what you do now to when you work for big organizations and some of the best employees in the world like Salesforce? So I, I would say mentally, the biggest thing is, is again, this, this whole idea of like, if you have a seed planted in your mind, go for it or you're going to regret it. I feel like it, it all comes back to that. Like ultimately, yes, you have the stability. Yes, you have a great uh, company, salary, whatever. Um, but what are you really risking trying out something new? You try out something new, you know, in the best case, you are super successful, make a lot of money. Maybe in the average case, you do OK. Maybe in the worst case, it fails. And, you know, hopefully if you leave on good terms, you would be welcomed back with open arms. And I mean, Salesforce, uh, there's this term in Salesforce boomerang of like an employee that leaves the company and then comes back. That's very prevalent in Salesforce. And, you know, when I was leaving, um, I left on good terms. Everyone was like, you know, Georgi, we're really sad that you're going, but, you know, if you ever want to come back, um, you're more than welcome. If we can, you know, assuming we can actually employ take you. you back in a half year, <laughs> you know that, yeah. you know that. And uh, I mean, frankly, the, the Salesforce ecosystem is so small that you'll end up working with the same people. Like I'll either continue to interact with some of the people I interacted with at Salesforce, or maybe they'll move to a partner, or maybe someone from partner will move to Salesforce. There's just so much movement and everyone knows each other that um, you, you're not really, I wouldn't say you're really leaving. You're just like being employed by a different entity, whether it's yourself, a partner, Salesforce, whatever. Right, it's, like, it's like you're still related. You're a distant relative yeah. now, but you're still involved. You still turn up to the family reunions. Yeah. You're yeah. still going to help each other. For, in terms of 2023, Yogi, look, you you know, I, I see more big things, you know, with what you just discussed in terms of launching your own building platforms in the UAE that haven't existed, the user groups that you're now championing. Any exclusives on 2023 and what people can expect from you without revealing too much? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I would say that, you know, I, I didn't answer your first question or your last question completely about, you know, uh, what are the challenges around uh, opening a business and going independent? I would say one of the biggest challenges is uh, how do you grow the business? You know, do you want to stay as an independent consultant? Do you want to start hiring people? Uh, it's like if you expand, how do you want to expand? Uh, do you onboard developers or like, um, you know, senior architects or how do you want to do that? I feel like that's kind of my big question mark for what I want to do for next year. You know, uh, so far I love being an independent consultant. It's absolutely amazing. But something inside of me is saying that I should start hiring people, trying to looking to expand. So you know, I think I need to debate that a bit internally um, for now, and then figure out what I want to do for next year. But it's just really cool to, you know, it's a good position have, to be in, though. Yeah, right? a lot of entrepreneurs go through that. I was speaking to someone last week where they were like. Do you want it to be a lifestyle business or do you want it to be something where you turn it into a big operation where, you know, you can scale, go through hyper growth. And eventually, if you have that aspiration to sell, you know, and if, if you get to that point, but it, it's an exciting position to be in because each one, you know, I feel is is something that still is successful in its own right. It just depends who you are. But I think for you, do you see that growth in the UAE? Like now that you're there, I know it's still early in Dubai, but do you see a need? For, for companies that are fresh, that are innovative, that are new, people like you who maybe want to create something that may be on a bigger scale and actually a talent pool as well. Like, is that something that you're seeing a lot more in Dubai? Yeah, I, I feel like um, just this this region of the world, not necessarily like Dubai or UAE, but just like the Gulf, uh, Middle East region. I feel like this region is 
there's just a huge opportunity for growth here. I feel like, you know, considering the geopolitical situation right now or over the past few years, uh, everything that's happening with the economy, uh, I just feel like everything is kind of aligning to, to help this region grow like crazy. And I, I think one of the biggest blockers here is the data residency aspect. So uh, as far as I know, I don't think Hyperforce is available here. So if, you know, for government entities that need their data to reside in UAE, as far as I know, that's not available today. Uh, if I'm wrong, we'll, we'll correct it in the comments, but <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's available today. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest blocker for adoption right now. I imagine that must be coming sooner or later. And then when that happens, I think there will just be like a huge boom in this region. And also with, you know, World Cup in Qatar, everything right now is like Qatar, Qatar, World Cup. You go to the grocery store, World Cup stuff everywhere. I feel like that's going to be a huge boom for this region as well. So I feel like there's a lot of opportunity. And then um, for myself, I was also thinking, you know, I, I didn't know anything about this region prior to moving here. And I was thinking, <clears throat> uh, even if I don't have like business in this region, it's right next door to Europe, you know, time zone wise, it's close. So I can easily fly there for business trips. So Europe is also a good option. So yeah, I feel like if you're thinking about UAE, just, just do it, frankly, do it. Message me on LinkedIn, you know, schedule some time to talk with me. I'm more than happy to share my experience. Just do it. <laughs> and depending how 2023 grows and what direction that Yogi wants to take, he potentially may be hiring. So if you're out there <laughs> and you think whether it's SFI or, or you just want to be connected to someone like Yogi who and, and turn mm -hmm. up to one of the user groups, when is the user group taking place? I saw you post it today. Can we just give a date to anyone watching Yogi that might be in Dubai? Because again, I think for the for the city, for Dubai, it's something that I hope now becomes more common with people like yourself there and you can build a, a, a genuine community and take it to that next level because I don't think someone's done that in Dubai yet. Yeah, so um, we're launching the Architect User Group. I'm not officially a leader, but applying to do that. So hopefully that comes through soon. But our first meeting is this Saturday on uh, 19th of November. So hopefully this episode comes out before then. But if not, don't worry. We're planning on having regular meetings like every month or two months, hopefully majority in person if, if things continue to be stable. So yeah, I look forward to a lot of exciting guests, a lot of exciting topics. Hopefully we can uh, bring some great stuff. Well, are you, well. Sorry, are you planning to be um, doing them also uh, virtually? Because I know a lot of people asked and, you know, myself and Hemi would be for sure interested also seeing it. Unfortunately, we can't be there for now. Uh, but is that something you're looking to do as well? Uh, for this first session, I think we'll do it in person just to, uh, you know, build the network, get, yeah. get to know people. Maybe in the future we'll do a hybrid. Um, I, I just think there is some kind of magic with in-person events and I would like to do primarily in person, but I don't know, maybe we'll do one session in person, one session in hybrid or fully remote. Yeah, we're, we'll, just we'll kind of we're, we're just gonna have to fly out to Dubai. We're just gonna have to fly out to Dubai and just take part in one of there the sessions. Go. And also, you know, it'll be great to see you, Yogi. I know you spoke a few things in the past, but again, with something like that next year, I think there's a lot of people that can take so much away from someone like you. So, you know, events, things like that, you know, I'm hoping to see more, even if it's in Europe and you're planning to do an event, Yogi, I'm sure, will be happy to fly out if it's for the right event. The one thing that we like to do right at the end, Yogi, is, is behind the cape, behind everything that you do in Salesforce, SFI, get to know you a little bit more as a person. Quick fire round, don't think too much, just whatever comes to mind. Uh, I suppose the first one is, is, is straightforward for me, logically. Favorite destination in the world, given you've been to so many places already? Brazil. Brazil. I, like I just absolutely love Brazil. I, I did my honeymoon there. I've been there like, I don't know, eight or nine times. I just love Brazilian people. I've loved Brazilian friends. Amazing place, amazing food. Yeah. Not many disagree with that. Talking on food, that was going to be my second question. Favorite cuisine, given that you've lived in so many places and you're in probably one of the most high level cuisine, culinary confinement places in Dubai, as you've seen with some of the restaurants there. But for you, at night, or if you had one meal after you've had a long CTA board meeting, what would you go for? So I'm kind of ashamed to say this, but I just absolutely love American chicken wings, you know, like <laughs> buffalo chicken wings. <laughs> I wasn't even expecting so, that, dude. Please don't I was judge thinking me for something that, like but... lavish, like <laughs> buffalo wings. Are we talking like barbecue or buffalo? A buffalo. I was thinking, yes. you know, should I should I come up with something more classy like Japanese or French or something? But I decided to be honest with you, so <laughs> don't judge me. No, man, please. Look, look, we love the fact that you can still keep it humble and just love a buffalo wing, man. That's the American in you. Uh, favorite pastime. So when you're not working and not doing all you're doing in terms of learning, supporting clients, 
you know, going all out. What do you do to unwind mentally? What helps you just to, to take off that load and just de-stress? So in Singapore, one of the things I picked up was uh, rollerblading. I used to love doing that as a kid up until I was like, I don't know, 12 or 13 when I think I just grew out of it. But then getting older, uh, I'm almost 33 now, you know, I need to start exercising, thinking about my health. And in Singapore, I picked up rollerblading again. So I started taking classes, did that for like a year. Um, now I would say I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I just need to start doing that more. Um, and then also I've been building computers since I was uh, 13 or 14. So here I have my uh, graphics card. Um, yeah, and so I, I love uh, PC gaming as well. I used to mine Bitcoins back in like 20, uh, 2008 or something. I used to have like, I don't know, 10 or 20 Bitcoin that I sold for, you know, $10 when at the peak it was like 100,000 or something. Yeah, so. <laughs> you see, you used that, man. But again, at that time, at that time, you, you didn't know. Yeah, you didn't know. It was some good money. Uh, yeah, for sure, man. But look, I mean, that, that's super interesting that you talked about it because health, you know, you're taking the time out. Rollerblading again, along with the buffalo wings. I don't think many were expecting that. Uh, this question, again, you might not have any, but if you could go back to your old self when you first started out, is there anything that you would have done different? Like looking at your career, what you've done, the achievements, and I'm not just saying it, man, like speaking to you today, I think it's clear for me and Nick how much you've dedicated to yourself, you know, how much time you've invested in your growth and also the risks and the opportunities that you've taken with both hands. Instead of being scared, you actually went all in. Is there anything that you would look back 10 years back that you would have changed or do you feel that everything ran its course and, and it was just meant to happen? I mean, uh, frankly, if I could go back, I would probably change a lot of things at every step. But like looking holistically, I feel like, you know, there were ups and downs, but overall, I'm happy with the journey. I grew a lot. There were a lot of challenging times, but I feel like, you know, those challenging times made me stronger. So as a whole, like, I can't really complain. Um, if there was anything I could like tell myself, you know, tell tell me 10 years ago, it would be to consider being a digital nomad. So digital, no, like, you know, be before I met my wife, um, I think what would have been really cool is to like be a digital nomad, you know, spend like a month in Bali, then a month in Brazil, then a month somewhere else, just basically like travel the globe, you know, be a freelancer, whatever, um, yeah, see, see more of the world. Um, but yeah, in, in the hindsight, you know, you can, you can say whatever you want, but, uh, I, I feel like I wouldn't have even thought of that unless I went through this whole journey that brought me here. So, yeah, I guess but just there's a time yeah, and place for everything in life, right? But I think you're right. Like even when me and Nick speak to candidates, if you're in that time of life where you don't have that extra responsibility and and it's just you, I always have that as well in my mind. You're where I wish I would have done the same because you don't realize it, right? Until you get to a certain point in life and you're like, man, for those two years, if I would have just stayed at home and been comfortable. I could have seen so many more places and done so much more in that time. But still, look, we're still here. We've still got plenty of time. Unfortunately for the podcast, I would love to keep you longer. But I know you've got things to do. On that note, look, amazing to have you on. I'm not just saying that, dude. For me and Nick, I think for people in SFI, for anyone watching it in Salesforce or any architect that's literally waiting or hoping to get to CTA, I hope that this resonates with them. And I hope that anyone who's looking at relocation as a scary thing, it is scary, but take some solace in what Yogi's done and, and hopefully some of the things that he said will help you. So on that note, Yogi, thank you for giving us your time, especially with Dubai being as it is right now. I know it's still, how hot is it out there still? I spoke to someone <laughs> yesterday. They said it was 35 degrees in November. I was like, what? Yeah, November? it's like 32 or 35, but really it's not so bad. I mean, Singapore was like 30 the whole year, but super humid here. There's very little humidity, so... Nikki, I feel for you, man. Sense. You're there blowing your nose in poor London. <laughs> <laughs> Typical UK weather here. You, you're, rainy, you're in like Dubai, foggy. Barcelona. You're there with a woolly jumper. I feel, I feel for you. But honestly, look, pleasure to have you on, Yogi. Uh, I can't wait till we actually meet in person, which I hopefully will be soon. And uh, please stay in touch because I, I'd love to see what you do. I'm sure we're going to hopefully collaborate in some way. But again, if you're in Dubai, if you're in the Gulf, UAE, reach out to Yogi on LinkedIn. I'm sure even if it's just advice, collaboration, anything with his new business and what he's doing, reach out to them because I think he's going to be doing some great stuff. On that note, peace, ciao, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks everyone. Stay tuned for the next episode and I'll see you around. And do reach out on LinkedIn if you want to chat. Have a good talk.